Lifetime in Time. Written and illustrated by Timothy John Vlado. Copyright 2006. Locanti and Mushlock Publishing. Prelude. Birth and Other Ugly Truths. It was the last day of class as he sat daydreaming at his desk. Announcements were passed out by an annoyed student that the teacher had made volunteer. As the papers hit his desk with a forceful shove, he glanced at them long enough to get the idea of the information and then quickly turned them over and used them for sketch paper. On the back of the announcement for the school's Sadie Hawkins dance, he drew a picture of a guitar that existed in no other place but in his dreams. The dance was far off, a couple of months at least, but he knew no girl would lower herself to ask him or maybe she would as part of a cruel joke, only to laugh at him in the halls and point in disgust with her girlfriends. When the bell rang, releasing the students into the world, he assessed the drawing, deemed it good enough to keep, folded it, and stuffed it into the lining pockets of his jean jacket. Always the last one picked for any team, he still prided himself on his ability to dodge just not the projectiles of the everyday gym class, but the traffic of the people to who the words, excuse me, would be meaningless. He was 20 feet from the door when he felt the push, and his body slammed into the side lockers with a boom. Before he even turned, he knew who it was. Jim Salante's claim to fame was the unexpected attack. He never did it without an audience. He never did it to someone bigger He never did it without his friends around his backup. His sense of humor consisted of violence and the use of poorly constructed obscenities that usually questioned his victim's sexuality. Since he had joined the football team, his random attacks had been worse. The boy didn't even stop long enough to understand the insult being hurled at him, and as the crowd laughed, he slipped through the door. The laughter was fresh in his ears as he checked behind him to make sure he wasn't being followed. It was high summer, right in the middle of March 1985. Everyone knew the winter wasn't over, but for at least a day or two the snow had melted and it was warm enough for the boy to wear a jean jacket and a down hunting vest on top of it. Ripped jeans and a bandana tied around his wrist was his attempt to be stylish. His hair was his attempt to be a rebel. It was long enough to annoy his parents, but not enough to be considered a threat by anyone else. Every time he tried to grow it out, it fought gravity and made him feel as though he had a reddish-brown Q-tip on his head. Puberty had been kind, at least to his chin, and gave him a, hey, I'll have a beard someday look, which he shaved into a weak goatee and wore proudly. Like most teenage boys, he spent more time thinking about girls than having the courage to talk to any. Most of this was from shyness. He had no problem talking at lengths to anybody about anything, but talking to girls of his own age without the safety of his group of friends was another matter. This problem could have stemmed from the time he was beaten up in junior high by a very large girl. It was a complete misunderstanding a playful insult fight that the girl had taken rather seriously. In the end, it left him holding his crotch while she lifted him off the ground by his hair. The onlookers cheered. To say the least, it did nothing for his self-esteem. Though by high school, the event was almost completely forgotten by everyone, it was still fresh in his mind, and one of the reasons he considered himself a loser in the eyes of others. There were others that got it worse than him, students whose names had become synonymous with being uncool, students that were ignored, or worse yet, sat alone at their lunch table, whose only interactions with others was when Tuesday's lunch special connected with their faces. He felt sympathy for them, knowing the wrong move, wrong act, or another kick in the groin, and he could very well fall into that same category. When the other bullies came to make their rounds, he was relieved just to be passed over for geekier targets. He had just turned 17 years old. His feet shuffled through the worn gravel on an old road that ran along the back of his house. Its ever-widening potholes threatened to become clouded gray lakes 
that reached to join the swamp of dried and brittle cattails. Somewhere deep in the reeds was a large wooden box that he and his friends had once used as a fort. They had found it one afternoon and had become their private hangout till the day much larger kids found it and claimed it as theirs. The smell of cigarettes would always bring him back to that moment. The older boy's cigarette had been his clue that something was wrong before he'd even gotten inside. The smoke was followed by a black eye that told him not to come back. Still, he felt the road was safe enough. He had traveled it many times since the record shop near the local grocery store opened. Nearly every day since it opened, he had been there, thumbing through records, flipping through magazines, and spending his allowance on the music that graced the budget bends, where the album of choice received a deep cut in their cardboard housing to deem it fit for those on a budget. He felt that most of this decade's music was pathetic, and he searched the store for those rare gems of hard rock. He spent more time there than money. All the employees knew him by name, and if he was any other loiterer, he would have been told to leave. Instead, on many occasions, he told the customers what album contained the song they were looking for and informed employees what was in or out of stock. There was nothing special about this record store that compelled him to visit every day other than it was in walking distance from his house and he had the time. Most of his friends were seniors. Considered losers like himself, they accepted him because he was funny and he could draw well. Most of them had after-school jobs, so when school let out, he spent his time at the record shop or when he felt the employees were getting annoyed with him, at the grocery store, looking through cheesy guitar magazines the record store didn't lower itself to carry. He wanted to be like his heroes, Alice Cooper, Black Sabbath, Rush. He knew all their albums, all the lyrics, and who played what instruments on each song. He spent more time reading about bands and practicing guitar, but still he dreamed of joining the ranks of the rock stars. Home was comfortable, middle class, suburban ranch with an attached garage, and two parents with heavy workloads. This left him to his drawings and the television. The wonder of cable TV had come out a few years before. To his dismay, his father deemed it that spending money for what was already free would be foolish at best. This left him to the mercy of regular programming, and most of the time he would find himself lost in old black and white horror movies or rerun comedy classics like the Marx Brothers and the Three Stooges. The public broadcasting station also grabbed his attention from time to time leaving him practicing his British accent and trying to understand the surreal humor of Monty Python's flying circus. He sent a discarded can flying across the puddles with a kick from his very comfortable but half-rotten tennis shoe. The can landed in a puddle of snow melt with a splash, and he made out a game of jumping over one puddle to the edge of the next. On his finger was a silver Indian ring his mother had given him. The reasons she had it were unclear, but he thought it was cool, though a little big for his hand. After today, it would only come off one more time. As he leapt between the puddles, the ring slid off his finger to the bottom of a muddy hole. In a panic, he shoved his hands into the puddle, drenching his sleeves, and after a few creative swear words, retrieved his valued piece of silver. He held it up to the rays of the sun. Parts of it gleamed in the daylight as he tried to scrape the mud away. He was so relieved he didn't hear the old truck bouncing toward him, splashing and honking until it sprayed him with a cold, dirty wake-up call. Opening his eyes, he wiped the mud from his forehead and turned in the direction of the laughter speeding away in the truck. As he turned back, something was wrong. It was like craning your neck around a corner and spying into a room. Try as he could, he couldn't pull his vision back to the road, and before he could understand what this anomaly was, he was no longer on earth. He looked around, and the best his eyes could tell him, he was in a clear room. There were no floor lines, no horizon, just two large, comfortable chairs. Sitting in the larger chair, a man dressed in black waved him over. He guessed the man to probably be in his late 30s, He had short, stylish black hair and was dressed in a 1920s business suit, 
as if he was in one of the old movies the boy had seen. Carefully watching his step and almost expecting to free fall into oblivion, he made his way over and nervously sat across from him. Uh, hello? Am I dead? The boy asked. Did that truck hit me? I, I don't remember anything that felt like a hit. Well, I remember the hit from the water, and that was wet. But that was just... No, no, my young friend, smiled the man. You're fine, quite healthy and intact. The man eyed the boy quietly, and the boy felt cold and damp from his sleeves to his toes. Oh, he said, looking around the room as if expecting something more sinister to appear. The room bothers you, doesn't it? Asked the man, breaking the tense quiet. Well, yeah, it's kind of freaky. Well then, think of a place, any place you like. The boy thought for a moment and the room started to flow and change, like the colors pouring from a paint tube. He grabbed the arms of his chair tightly for security. When the room stopped moving, the two were still sitting, but in the middle of a large field. I take it back, he said. This is freaky. This looks just like my grandfather's cornfield. It is, or at least a facsimile of it, said the man. That is what your mind remembered on the surface. Are you sure I'm not dead? Grandpa's field is now surrounded by racing tracks. The man studied him for again what seemed to be a long time. It had made him uncomfortable, like the pause in a parent's voice when you're about to have a serious discussion that will somehow wreck your plans for the next couple of weeks. I'm sorry, said the man tiredly. My name is Doshin, and I am the keeper of the gateway. As the man spoke, he straightened his tie. What's the gateway? the boy asked. Well, on your planet. Planet? exclaimed the boy, cutting him off. Yes, the man replied, clearly annoyed at the interruption. I said planet. Oh, the boy mumbled, feeling an uncomfortable knot in his stomach and thinking, Okay, I'm not dead. I've been abducted by aliens. The man continued. A gateway is an opening that leads to another place. This gateway leads to every place. Every place? He questioned, running his fingers through his hair and flicking the remainders of the mud off. Every place in time, space, and even other realities and dimensions. With her I travel anywhere or any time I feel the desire to. I created her over a million years ago as you would perceive time, and now I am ready to move on. Look, I hate to keep repeating everything you say like someone that doesn't get the point, but I'm really someone who doesn't get the point. How can you be a million years old? Time passes differently in the gateway, and I've had a little help as well. Things don't decay here, for we are literally outside of time and space, in a place called the webs. Noticing the expression on the boy's face was strained, he explained, the webs are the life force of time and reality. They are outside of time and space, and our reality's body. They allow us to instantly open a door to any point we like, for here all places are one, as are all times. Outside of the gateway we age. After the first hundred years of time accumulated outside, I was looking and feeling a little ragged. Thus, the heartstone. The heartstone is a large emerald egg, the size of your fist. Once you replace your heart with it, you are as near to an immortal as a once mortal being can come. So you're immortal, and now I'm either stuck in some sort of science fiction movie or crazy. You know, the boy started to rant, I watch a lot of movies, and it's not like the concept of time travel is beyond me, or any other concept, aliens, other realities. I mean, I've read a lot of comics, it's just there's a mess of things that you're hitting me with. Gateways, webs, time travel, the green egg being shoved into your body and taking the place of your heart, and now you're claiming to be immortal on top of this? Yes. After a million years, I am ready to accept death and move on. So if you're immortal, how can you die? He asked, fidgeting in his chair and trying to wipe his face, feeling the mud that the truck splashed as it dried on his cheek. Well, it takes a great effort, but the heartstone can be cracked, and once it does, it becomes dust, and that's the end. 
Well, the end of this existence, he said, placing his hand over his heart. I believe that's only the beginning to the next chapter. With that, he gestured to a spot in the field, and a small stone table appeared with a large greenish egg on it. He got up, addressed the egg, and with the gesture of his hand stated, This is me. I thought that was supposed to be in your chest, the boy said, walking over to the green stone and giving it the once over. It was, he replied with a strange ring of pride in his voice. With a hard stone, you age about one year for every thousand you live. When you get too old, you usually put yourself into a trance or a coma, if your body hasn't made the decision for you. And then the egg goes dormant. After about a hundred years, it activates and regenerates a much younger body, and the process starts over again. Right now, I am dormant. He turned and scanned the horizon, as if this common setting had started to become entrancing. As the breeze mussed his hair, he continued talking, though his voice drifted as if his mind was far away. This body that you are talking to is a creation of a gateway, and in truth doesn't even look like my real body. I decided that my real appearance might disturb you, so I picked something that you might find more comforting. The boy stared at the egg, almost as if he was hypnotized. At first glance, the stone appeared to be nothing more than shiny, brilliant green. The longer he looked, the surface took on patterns, and patterns within patterns. Its layers seemed to peel away, revealing its never-ending depths, as if he had the ability to stare through a building and allow his eyes to search the rooms and the world beyond. Patterns gave away to textures, Textures gave away to forms and then sound, and for a brief moment he felt like the egg might just suck him in, and he closed his eyes to regain himself. He realized that the man had stopped talking, and a strange fear started to build in him. The quiet wasn't helping. What if you get hurt before you go dormant, he asked, while restraining his urge to poke at the stone the way children play with fire. Well... If you lose a limb, it stays lost till the end of your next dormancy, at least outside the gateway. Aside from the destruction of your body, you heal pretty quickly, though you do get to keep some of the scars. The gateway has the ability to fix most of your injuries and can even recreate replacement limbs. What, what do you really look like? The boy asked with a tinge of curiosity in his voice. Do you really want to know? smiled the man. Uh, sure, I guess. How bad can it be? After all, I'm an Alice Cooper fan. Without a word, Doshin's form flowed into a large, old, 300-pound salamander-shaped creature with heavy, string-like eyebrows and a fleshy goatee. His skin was shiny black as if it was wet with large yellow markings that made him resemble the salamanders the boy used to catch in the window wells when he was younger. In his true form, his mouth was toothless. Whether this was due to his age or his species was beyond the boy to comprehend. Then he climbed around the chair, trying to make himself more comfortable. He grabbed the chair firmly to ensure his stability. With his body pressing hard against the padding, he turned his head completely around to gaze at the boy. His eyes were black and transparent, and for a moment the boy gasped, wondering how well the keeper's eyes could see without pupils. Wow, you could be like in Star Wars or a BBC sci-fi show or something. I found out early on that traveling in different places, it was best to look like I fit in. So shape-shifting was something I had to learn. It always was fun around hippies and at the witch trials. He said nostalgically, Wow, that is totally cool. I mean, can you teach me to do that? The boy was excited, momentarily forgetting his fear. Oh, you will learn how. But not for me. My time is short. Sensing something was wrong, the boy took a few steps back and squinted at the old reptile. Why am I here? His voice seemed very loud to him, and he suddenly felt very cold. Can't you figure it out? questioned the man. You're going to be the next keeper. No way! I'm not putting one of those things in my chest. That's got to hurt like hell. The boy jumped away from the heartstone as if it was a rattlesnake. In his back of his mind, he thought about running, but to where? The end of the field? But then what? 
He realized the old lizard was ignoring his panic and continued talking to him, knowing the boy had no option of escape. Oh, you don't get a hard stone until after you mastered shape-shifting, or your body won't be able to do it. I've never quite figured out why. He gazed up to the sky as the clouds had distracted him. I think it has something to do with the hard stone wanting to keep the body in its true form. Anyway, he smiled sadly, it's too late for that kind of pondering. What if I don't want to be the keeper? The creature turned back into his previous human form, but now his expression became almost evil. Why in heaven's name do you think you have a choice? He tilted his head upward and spoke a one-word command to the air. Proceed. Tentacles of steel formed like hot plastic from the ground, securing the boy's limbs and lifting him off the floor. He felt like a thousand needles had all tried to numb him at once, and his head seemed to swim in a thick kaleidoscope paste. His body stiffened, and he blacked out. Slowly, the boy awoke with a pounding in his head and a tingling in his body, as if all his limbs were still asleep. He remembered something like all the colors of the color wheel spinning and focusing into a bright white light that became an all-enveloping gel. Images of the keeper kept popping in and out of his head, as if someone had taken a razor blade to a film reel and spliced it together in the wrong order. As the pounding in his head lessened and his tingling subsided, he realized he was both naked and very cold. Then a familiar voice startled him. Thur, said the voice with the list. Thur, please get off the floor. We will find you something to make you feel more comfortable. He jumped to his feet and tried to cover himself the best he could with clenched knees and two hands. His legs were wobbly, and it took several attempts to achieve a standing pose. Hey, I'm naked here. Where's my damn clothes? Sorry about that, sir, but the gateway is a little upset about the loss of the former keeper. All things considered, she was quite fond of him. The voice was coming from a silver soccer ball floating in the air. In the middle of the ball was a glass circle that seemed to function as an eye. It whirled left to right and would blink as if it was a camera's aperture in the hands of a very indecisive photographer. Who are you? Where are my damn clothes? He said, still hiding himself. I was programmed by the former keeper in case the gateway was stubborn. I'm to be your assistant until she warms up to you. The last time she didn't talk to a new keeper for over a month. Could you just get me some damn clothes? Certainly. A person-sized hole opened in a wall leading to an empty mall. The boy quickly ran through and was grateful that the temperature was warmer, although now he was nervous about being naked in a very public place. He kept trying to replay his recent abduction in his mind. He could remember clearly his talk about being the new keeper and even things about the gateway and the heartstone. When he tried to push his memory to what happened after the steel tentacles grabbed him, it was a sketchy mess at best, and part of him just didn't want to know. He remembered something heavy in his hands, a loud cracking sound, faint sobbing, and then nothing. Where the hell am I? He asked. Oh, you're in the gateway, said the ball. It can recreate a version of anything that existed or ever did, and things that have never been. It can even play back events throughout history and things to come. I chose this mall because you requested clothes, and from our data, this mall is the place where you've required the most of your clothing up to this point. It was true. The boy and his friends had never let a weekend go by without a trip to the mall. It was one of the few places they could hang out without the interference of parents. It contained clothing stores that carried the latest fashion, which they couldn't afford, a food court, and the only movie theater in the area. In the fall and spring, it seemed to be the one place his mother enjoyed dragging him to the most, if only to buy clothes he would rarely wear. The ball followed the awkward running boy into a hip store. Hiding himself behind a rack of pants, he pulled on a pair of men's zebra print trousers, something that any metal god from 1985 would be proud to wear. So there's nobody here, right? The boy asked nervously. If you like, I can have anybody you want created. I can even make it appear as if the mall is in the height of its fail season. No, no, that's quite all right, he said, grabbing a black t-shirt. What just happened to me? 
Well, the former keeper transferred the power to you. I apologize for the intense pain it caused. Pain? What pain? I didn't feel any pain, he said as he walked to the leather store. Oh, you did, but I suppose it's like birth. One doesn't really remember that, do they? The ball said, or at least so I'm told. The boy put on a pair of black cowboy boots and stomped them down. Then what? he asked. Then you killed him. Excuse me? the boy said in shock, trying to desperately search his memories for such an event. Well, the only way for him to pass was for you to break his hearthstone. You were pretty out of it and open to suggestion. He told you to pick up a big hammer that he had acquired on his travels. It was created by the elder gods. He said goodbye to the gateway, and then you hit it. I killed him? The boy's face paled and was turning even whiter. Nothing but dust. That is the one of the reasons that the gateway is not talking to you. The boy put on a leather jacket with fringe and slid down to sit on the display stand. Great, just great. I started out today as a loser. Now I'm a loser and a murderer? I don't remember killing him. Not really. His head started to pound. Really, sir, the choice in the matter was not your own. Without a lifeline to link the gateway, T cannot keep time flowing forward in here and would cease to exist. I believe that is the reason you are here. He did not want her to die. Who? The gateway. Without your life, she couldn't function linearly and would explode, for outside her, all time is the same time, and, and yada, 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 he interrupted as his headache had become too much to continue on this course. He took a deep breath. Do you have a name? I'm yet to be named. It's your job. Your voice sounds familiar, but I can't place it. The former keeper programmed me with the voice of Larry Fine of the Three Stooges. Our records show that you re responded favorably to that program. In fact, I've also been made aware of all your favorite pop culture trivia. Well, I didn't think I watched the Stooges that much. All right, I guess your name is Larry, but could you cut down on the lisp a little? What lisp? That one. At your command, Thire. Thire, said the boy with the grimace. You mean sire? My lord, Larry said, trying to appease the frustrated teenager. My lord? I'm not Jesus, Larry. My lord was a common greeting during the world's middle ages. The term was used to signify the owner of the land. The peasant paid their taxes to their landlord. Well, you're not a peasant, the boy pointed out, but I am sir, your servant. And the gateway is now your land, and so much more. My lord, servant, sir, sire, I, I, they don't sound right for Larry Fine's voice. What are my other options? He unbuttoned the coat, realizing that he was shirtless, and to his memory, most stores didn't allow that. Hey, here's a brilliant idea. Why not call me by my name? The former keeper thought it wasn't best practices to be called by your name. He believed that it was important to keep your life in the gateway separate from your life at, on your home planet, whatever planet you called home, though he had many different names. Larry could tell that he was rapidly losing the interest of the boy. Until you choose a name, how about I just call you Boss? You mean Boss? That's what I said. Yeah, sure, whatever, he said, giving in. Did I really kill him? This time he is truly dead. Larry momentarily lost his lisp and sounded rather electronic. I don't feel so good. It's not surprising. You've been in a coma for three days. Three days? My parents are going to freak. My dad goes out looking for me if I'm 20 minutes past curfew. Oh, I am so dead. Both, you can go back to your timeline even before you left if you like. But I wouldn't recommend it. You might run into the former you. Being the keeper, you now have almost complete control over time. Oh, yeah, he lied, feeling like he somehow should have known this, but was unsure, wondering if he had missed it in all the excitement. I guess there is a bonus to being the keeper, even if you have to run around and I'm all naked. He was relieved to know that at least he didn't have his parents to contend with, and with luck, they wouldn't find out he was a murderer. Was he a murderer? This question seemed surreal. Without any memory of it, how could he know for sure? Maybe he was just an accomplice to an assisted suicide. That thought wasn't much more comforting than the first. Larry's voice broke into his private ramblings. If I could make a suggestion, 
There is a food court around the corner, and I'm sure that you're hungry. Maybe you will feel better after you eat. I'm not really hungry, he said, fixating on the murder he couldn't remember. Maybe once you see the court. The boy gave him a weak nod, and he realized he was starting to chew on his fingernails. Yeah, fine, whatever. The two headed off to the food court. Everything about this felt wrong. He felt like he was wearing stolen clothes. He also felt like at any moment the police were going to suddenly appear, pull their guns on him, and arrest him for breaking and entering. After the first two attempts to find his misplaced wallet and pay for the food that he wanted, he decided to take advantage of the moment. The food would magically appear from one side of the food line to his tray whenever he asked for something. Talking to the air felt strange, but within seconds he had become like a little kid in the candy store, and in a short time he had ordered everything he could stomach. Larry had to help him balance the tray to the table, and they only lost one order of fries with gravy. As soon as it hit the floor, a small cinder block-sized robot had managed to clean it up and fetch him another one. He sat for the longest moment in silence, just staring at the food that would have normally been a treat. He wondered if this was a dream. He wondered if he would wake or if he would find himself at any moment in a straitjacket, being fed his daily meds and a cup of applesauce. He knew one of his grandmothers had had electric shock therapy, and though all of his family said it helped her, he wondered if she had delusions of being a keeper. She always seemed sane to him. After playing with his mountain of food and only taking a few bites, the silence had become too much for him. He looked up at Larry, who was waiting like a loving dog. Now what? asked the boy, who had started to stack his fries to create a miniature log cabin instead of eating them. Whatever you like, Both. The boy, who was very tired, replied in a half sob. I just want to go to sleep. Would you like to design your bedroom now? Just a bed in a dark room, Larry. In the middle of the food court grew a ten-foot cube with a door and a comfy bed. When the boy's head touched the pillow, he was asleep. Gotta go. Gotta go. I got to go!